right, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us. I wanna be the first to welcome you back to Tableau Tuesday. This month, we're going to be diving into the psychology of visual analytics and also harnessing that know-how to inform our own visualizations. This is a topic that we often cover within Tableau, but there's a lot more voices that we can add to this conversation to make it more robust. So today we have two fantastic guest speakers joining us, both experts in their field and both very excited to share their wisdom on optimizing data for human consumption. So before I pass it over to them, there's a couple of housekeeping items first. You know, it's the normal thing we always do. So everyone is muted by default coming into the webinar today. But that being said, we want to hear your questions. So if any questions come up, and I'm sure there will be, make sure to direct those to the Q&A panel rather than the chat. So you can get to the Q&A panel within that WebEx menu, click the, the ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot option, and we're going to keep up on that Q&A. It just makes it easier to keep track of which questions have been answered and answer them in line rather than in a big stream like the chat. So stay away from the chat if you can. So without any further ado, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce our two guest speakers today, Dr. Kevin O'Brien and Dr. Shannon Halgren, both from Sage Research and Design. So Kevin has 30 years of experience as a human factors engineer serving technology leaders across a broad spectrum of industries, including Hewitt Packard, Emerson Process Management, Cummins, Brocade, AT&T, Sprint, Sun Microsystems, and Palm. Prior to working as a consultant, Kevin was a human factors engineer for Pacific Bell and Lockheed Martin at NASA's Johnson Space Center. His projects include design and testing of graphical displays for monitoring internet and telephony networks, system monitoring displays for the space station and space shuttle, and the basic research on human processing of information displays and system alarms. Kevin's graduate work and PhD dissertation at the University of Kansas focused on psychophysics and mathematical models of visual information processing. He's a regular contributor to the Kansas City R Users Meetup Group and is coming to us from Kansas City today. Shannon specializes in product user experience with an emphasis in user research. Her passion for this field led her to found Sage Research and Design, a longstanding UX consultancy dedicated to helping startups as well as more established clients like Google, Indeed, Dell, SolarWinds, Oculus, and eBay to create products with exceptional user experiences. Under Shannon's leadership, Sage has grown to a thriving consultancy of senior level researchers. Shannon received her master's and doctorate in experimental psychology from Rice University, where she specialized in human computer interaction and user experience. Shannon is presenting from Boulder, Colorado today, where I personally met her and worked with her about five years ago, and man, does time fly. So I am so excited to have them both here today. I'm going to hand it over to them to discuss a little bit about their work with Sage, and I'll let them go ahead and kick it off. Kevin, Shannon, welcome. Thank you so much, Brianna. We're really excited to be here. And thanks to all of you who are taking time out of your busy day to be with us. We're excited to share this really fun topic with you. Um, before we get going, though, we thought it would be helpful to add a little bit of context and background about how Kevin and I work. Um, so at Sage, we have a lot of fun using our background in psychology every day to help our clients build better products for the human beings who use them. So as you can see, and Brianna mentioned, we've worked with a really wide variety of clients across a lot of different verticals, a lot of different sizes of businesses, a lot of different um, products and uses. And um, we utilize a lot of different user experience research techniques and also users under design methods, um, including medical human factors and making those sorts of products safe and effective for use. Um, so we're excited to share with you not only the sorts of things we learned in grad school, but with working with these clients over the years. And um, let's, without further ado, get, get going. Um, we'll, we'll dig in now. So um, we thought we'd start at a super high level. Don't worry, we won't spend much time here because we think you probably already know why using data visualizations are a good idea. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's just spend a few moments. Um, so, um, obviously, here we, we know that there, you have a choice when you present your data. You can do it either in a tabular format or using as some sort of visualization. And tables are great. That's a nice, neat way to present your data. 
But tables are really hard to look at carefully and understand what's going on with your data. Whereas, of course, visualizations can tell the story much faster and much more effectively. So next slide. So good graphs do more, um, good graphs re reveal more than just a listing of the data. They can do things like show group differences and how relationships change. So for instance, on the graph on the right, on the left, sorry, you can see quite clearly there are two groups and they differ from each other. One group is changing at a different pace than the other. Graphs can also, for example, show you the quality of a linear fit, like you can see on the residual graphs on the right. Okay, so that was just a very good high level view. Data visualizations, good thing. So let's continue on and now talk about a topic that maybe you don't know quite as much about, um, human information processing. So we'll start by just giving you, um, of course, starting with the definition of what human, pro pro human information processing is. You can see that it's a, a process that includes a lot of things. It's about how we human beings um, assimilate and, and, um, and access information and then what we do with that information. So we're going to demonstrate it um, using just a really simple example of driving a car. Driving a car is something we do mostly automatically, and which is really scary because when you think about all the things that are involved in driving a car, it, it's really highly complex. And, and yet it's something that sometimes we don't even feel like we have to think about while we're doing it. So let's break it down a little bit. When we're driving a car, visually, we're inputting a lot of information. So we're looking ahead outside on the road to um, signs that might be driving conditions, cars that are, that are ahead of us. But there's also a lot of information we're visually processing inside the car on that dashboard, different, um, you know, the gas gauge, the speedometer, um, any warning lights. So visually a lot is coming into us. There's also, um, we're using our other senses while we're driving things like, go ahead, uh, Kevin, put the next one. Um, so our other sensors, such as smell, if we suddenly smell something funny coming from the engine or from um, the, the tires, for instance, we know something is up. We also are using um, our hearing to hear different things that are going on, perhaps with our vehicle or outside the car. And also we have a kinesthetic response that having to do with how the driving is, the steering wheel um, feels to us or those pedals on the floor. All right, next slide. Thanks, Kevin. So psychologists have developed mental model or models of information processing for years, and there's a lot of them out there. And um, you can just see at a glance that there are some really simple ones out there and there are some really complicated ones out there. And some go into a lot more details and involve a lot more elements than others. But we thought for today, just to give you a taste, we would talk about one of the simpler ones out there, which is called perception, cognition, and action, PCA for short. So we'll break it down for you a little bit and talk about first that perception piece of it. So perception is all about getting the input from our senses. And I really like this diagram because it's showing you exactly what's happening. There's all these inputs coming into us all at the same time in parallel. And some of those inputs make it into our brain and some of them don't. So there's this idea and this, um, this piece that we do as humans, we have attention. And some of that intention, uh, attention is explicit and we have control over and some of it we don't have control over. But regardless if we feel we have control over it or not, that attention basically filters those inputs into our brain. Some of them make it in some don't. So there's this idea of this funnel that is only so big and only so much can get in. So once it's in, we move on to then to the cognition step. What happens to that information once it comes into our brain? Well, these are that's where things like memory come into play. And of course, you know, we have short term memory and that's about retaining new information, but just for briefly. And long term information then comes into play and that's a resource for recognition and identification of those inputs that have come in. And then our brain has a lot of rule sets it used to, uses to determine what to do. It makes decisions based on those rule sets that have come from past experiences or learning. And then and those rule sets help us determine what response is needed. So then that moves us on to the action piece. 
And action is interesting because, of course, it can be skill-based and based on prior experience and, pro and practice, and this determines the effectiveness of that response. And so um, that response then can manifest as a physical performance of the task. In this case, for instance, pushing a button. So again, that's just a really quick overview, but we thought maybe to solidify it, that we would um, break it down for you again with that real world example of driving. And specifically, we'll hone in on an event that might happen while you're driving. And that is the event of a warning light coming on on your dashboard. So in the event that uh, a warning light is there, the perception part of it is you recognize that there's a, a new light on your dashboard and you perceive that light as red. You might also see, if you have really good eyesight, the small text next to it that would read temperature, or maybe you have an icon, and so you see a little symbol. That then moves into that cognition, and, and um, we know from past experience that red typically means hazard, something's going on, something that needs our attention. Um, we also know that that red hazard light next to the temperature um, dial or gauge has to do with the engine temperature. This tells us, hopefully, that we should then be worried and start attending to other warnings. That might backstep us back to the perception and you might say to yourself, huh, am I smelling anything? Am I seeing any smoke? Is, is there anything else I should you know, be letting into that filter into my brain? And all that then would funnel into the decision that we need to make. So what should we do in response to all this input? Should we pull over? Should we keep driving to the next service station? Should we ignore it? Hopefully, our brain is telling us to take the safe path and pull over. And then that, of course, that leads to the action of slowing down and steering to the shoulder. So again, at a really high level, that's information processing in a nutshell. So now I'll turn it over to Kevin and he's gonna talk to you a little bit about data. So in this segment, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, data and how data fits in a graphical representation. And uh, the objective here is really to establish some common terminology and basic concepts that hopefully that that what I found in 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 researching this is that we use lots of different terminology, not only uh, across different uh, uh, backgrounds, but even across different uh, applications and tools related to data visualization. So this is at least a common starting point. Uh, and gives us some common basis for discussion. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but at least it'll give us a sense of, uh, of some issues where it comes to the actual data itself. And so first off, I want to point out, you know, data consists of descriptions and values. So in the example I have here, we have variations on brand and model name to separate cars into group. So in this case, what we have is these brand and model are classification variables. And then on the right side of the table, we have numbers for length, average price, units sold, and rating for each model. And the thing I want to point out is that these numbers represent very different concepts. So first off, length is a measurement, and it's the result of measuring a car model on a systematic number scale. The next thing we have is average price, and that's a statistic. The average is calculated is a calculated point of estimate of the most representative value for sales price. And the sales price of the individual cars that um, resulted in this uh, in this statistic vary somewhat around that average. Then we have uh, units sold, and units sold is a count. That's how many cars were sold during a period of time. It doesn't have any variability. It's just how many were sold during that period of time. And the last one we have here is rating, which is a classification. So the rating name includes a number, but we have no idea what the rater's uh, bias does to the spacing between those numbers. So the range is five, but you know maybe a reviewer says, I never use one and two, and I pick between three and four randomly, and I hardly ever use five. So in that case, this rating, even though it has a number, that's a classification, it's not a number scale. So the next thing um, 
we have a taxonomy of um, types of values and variables. Um, in this taxonomy, the value types are described as discrete or continuous. And again, this, this is a dichotomy that is lots of different terms across different applications and ac across different fields. And even, I mean, you grab one book on data analysis and another book and they'll use different terms, but they're talking about the same thing. The key thing here is discrete variables separate observations into groups that can be counted. Continuous variables provide a measure on each observation. And when we're creating data visualizations, the graphic elements used should tell the user about the data that, that we're trying to represent. And the simplest example here is bar segments that bars segment the observations into groups and then represent counts. And so think of stacking up coins, think of stacking up cars sold, whatever it might be. It's, it's an amount and that is very well represented by a bar. Points on the other hand show the location of some continuous numeric value for one observation. So in this case, we might we might measure uh, a lot of different days, and some of those days have the same high temperature. Um, and we put them in a group, and then we can see kind of the distribution of those uh, daily high temperatures across a set of days. There's this funny overlap between discrete and continuous where we get to number four there, which is called integer valued. Um, and that gets back to the rating scale we just talked about. Sometimes um, those integer values really are representations of the numbers one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Sometimes they are uh, uh, only represent an order um, and a number value was given to them and we really have no sense about any kind of systematic spacing. The next thing um, we can talk about is the goal we have. One goal when we're creating data visualizations is to avoid deceiving yourself and to avoid deceiving viewers by presenting measures as counts or statistics as measures. And so as an example here, first thing we say is, well, you know, what, what about counts? Well, counts tell us how much and bar graphs do a really nice job of showing how much. Measures tell us what value. Um, uh, 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 plots that show data points are really good at saying this is the value. It could have been a different value, but this is the value that we've got. And then the last thing is statistics. Statistics by definition are a calculated value based on lots of other observations. And statistics, the key things that they have is a, a center and a spread. And the thing that you want to be sure and not is not represent them as something they're not. <clears throat> um, so the best thing to do is to carry along with that statistic some indication of what kind of what kind of center you're you're giving people and then what kind of variability there was in the data. And so because of the nature of the data, the underlying data, there are some real advantages to using one kind of data type, uh, plot type uh, versus another. And of course, there's always exceptions to the rule, but by and large, this is a good uh, point of reference for uh, what kind of, uh, of graph elements to use for different data types. And the next thing we want to think about is um, a data set might be a single measure on each point of observation, or the data set might be a whole lot of different measures. And while we don't very often necessarily run into these single measure on each point of observation kinds of things, it's helpful to think about um, how the world expands from that really simple data set to the kinds of data sets we typically see. So on the left side here, what we've got is the height of children. So we've got a group of 20 children in the fourth grade and we just have their height in inches. Um, 
And so the, on this, on this uh, uh, dot plot, what we can see is we can see um, where each, um, where the measurement is for each student. We can see that there's a variation across the set of students, and we can see there's kind of an upper and lower boundary. Then we transfer that and say, okay, well, let's, let's take a more realistic expectation, and that is that maybe we compare the height of children in two different grades. And we basically transpose that information. We're flattening out um, horizontally, grouping the data into the fourth grade group and the fifth grade group. So now we can immediately see that variability is roughly about the same, um, but the fifth grade group is shifted uh, up um, a few inches in height. And that's typically what we would expect. And then we take and expand it and go a little bit further and say, okay, now where do we go when we start taking more than one measure? Um, and now what we've got on the far right is we've got the standard scatter plot where now we are showing the measures on both the horizontal and vertical axis. We've got height and weight, and we start using the markers in the graph to discriminate between the two groups. Um, and we can pretty readily see again now that um, weight is uh, highly correlated with height, and that the two age groups uh, differ in a, in a direction that you would reasonably expect. The other thing I want to point out here, just kind of as a starting point, the other thing to see is that it doesn't take color to be able to represent any of this data. Um, so that's just some basic ideas. Again, here we can see that um, there are some preferred kind of uh, graph types to represent this information. Um, but uh, what we want to do now is go into a further discussion and let's start talking about the ways most of uh, people start to uh, process this information in graphs and how we can um, optimize graphs for the way people process information. All right. So in many ways, we just had you eat your broccoli. Um, that we know a lot of that is sort of review, perhaps for some of you, and maybe the introduction to information processing is new. Um, but now let's get on to the really fun part of combining that. Now that we know the data behind the graphs and a bit about what information processing is, how can we leverage what we know about information processing into our data visualizations? So in this section, we're going to go through a couple of high level tips and lots of examples. Um, so the first thing we encourage you to do as you're thinking about what data visualization is most appropriate for your use is to first think about what is the goal of your data visualization. And the first thing you might want to decide is, are you going to take a persuasive stance in that? Do you want your data visualization to suggest a conclusion to your audience? Or do you want the data to stand alone and, um, and have your audience draw their own conclusion? So we're going to start by showing you kind of an extreme example of a visualization that shows um, that takes a stance and wants to persuade their audience. What we're showing you here is, is taken from a it's a political visualization. So maybe by definition, it's persuasive. And probably the first thing you notice as you glance at this are those two red circles. And that was probably done quite intentionally. So you notice first that there's quite a difference in the size of those circles. Now, what you might not have noticed right away is if you look at the number inside those circles, it's actually about a one to two ratio there. But if you consider the size of those circles, go ahead and click Kevin. Um, it's at, the circles are actually one to three ratio. So that's quite persuasive, perhaps a little misleading. You can decide if that's ethical or not. Um, but it's a great example of, again, a persuasive visualization. <clears throat> Another design choice that the designer made in this case is they're only presenting the average. And I think you, you as an audience probably collectively know an average doesn't always tell the full story behind the data. It doesn't, for instance, talk about variability. But now if we speak, look at the graph on the right, this is a good example of a design choice that wants the audience to draw their own conclusion. It's telling the full story behind the data. 
Um, in this case, they're showing the, the box plots with, and, and the whiskers, of course, show the variability in the data, which then allows the audience to see the full picture and draw their own conclusions. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, next slide. Another design choice you might want to think about before you begin is what do you care more about, form or function in your graph? These two graphs or um, visualizations are actually showing largely the same data. Obviously, the one on the left is, is stunning. It's a really lovely design. Um, both graphs are talking about um, gender differences in authorship, so the New York Times that fiction bestsellers. The one on the left, um, you know, at a glance, you get a really good sense by looking at the color of the dots, how many uh, male versus female authors there are. So it does a, it's, it's, it's great because it's beautiful. It gives us a, at a glance understanding to see a pattern there. The one on the right, however, would be more appropriate if you're wanting your audits to at a glance understand more details of the data, you know, really see a trend happening or be able to see a very specifically how many uh, authors in each year, for instance. Now, neither choice here is right or wrong. It just depends on what your goal is with the visualization. So it's important to think that through and establish it before you dig in. Okay, next slide. All right, we know this is a boring slide, but we really did want to bubble up um, these references. Um, so another thing we want to consider you to consider is the ease of access to the graph. And what we mean by that is the readability and the ease of interpretation of the graph. And there was a lot of groundbreaking work done by Cleveland McGill, a psychologist in the mid 1980s. And they did a lot of studies and um, on the, the interpretation and readability of graphs. And specifically, they came up with some really highly practical, usable solutions that um, and essentially came up with a hierarchy of what graphs are easiest to use versus hardest to use. So on this slide, you get to pretend to be one of their participants. So along the bottom, you're seeing several different kinds of graphs, and all of them have a little A and a little B on them. So just for fun, look at each graph and say to yourself, which is bigger, the, the element A or the element B? And if you're like Cleveland and McGill's participants, you'll see that from left to right, it's easiest to hardest to answer that question, which is bigger, A or B. So in their research, what the, the psychologists did is basically break down the elements of a graph. And they found that graphs, um, and I'm looking at the left side here, that, for instance, um, visualize data or represent data with length and put those data points along an identical um, common scale. Those kinds of graphs are the easiest and most accurate to read. Um, go back, Kevin. Sorry, I'm just going to talk a little bit more. And then um, as you go along from left to right, um, the, the uh, uh, graphs that use angle or circles um, in shape to represent data are a little bit harder to read. And then, of course, the hardest to read um, graphs are ones that use volume, like heat maps or color and hue, like that, that graph on the right. It's really hard to tell the difference between those shades of blue used to represent A and B. And plus, we don't even know what those colors represent. So by definition, you, you need a legend or something for that kind of graph. OK, Kevin, thanks. Go ahead. OK, so what do we walk away with this? Well, pretty simply, if speed and accuracy is important to you in your graph, think of this hierarchy. And you probably want to choose um, one of these graphs, like a bar graph that uses length to represent your data. If, however, speed and accuracy aren't as important, then you can loosen up a little and probably have fun with style and experiment with using things like area or color to represent, but just know that comes at a sacrifice of interpretation. Okay, and one more thing to um, mention that comes from Cleveland McGill's data is this idea of alignment. So um, here you're seeing, uh, again, you know, compare the two graphs, which one's easier to tell the difference between an A and B. And it's pretty glaringly <laughs> obvious that if you use a similar scale to align your data, it makes it a lot easier to make comparisons between those data points. So again, if, a, if a speed and accuracy are important, make sure that you think about alignment in your design. Okay, Kevin. Okay, so um as, as shannon indicated now we're just we're going to start running through lots of 
of examples and try and tie them back to um, uh, phenomenon and uh, processing and performance things related to uh, the way humans process information uh, to kind of support the way th the way we can do things. The first example here, uh, key thing here is what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, make sure that our graphs uh, make patterns in the data easy to see. So this notion of patterns, okay, so we have visual patterns and there's patterns in the data. At least some data there is, some of it's just all noise. But the thing is we want to expose the patterns in those data. Um, so this is an example here. You know, this one in the uh, the top left, you know, what we're looking at here is we're looking at units sold, sales by month across a couple of years. The top one, um, you on the left, we've got um, the years, uh, the sales for the two years for a month joined together. And you can kind of see what's going on there, but we go to the right-hand side. If we group them by year, if the thing that we're trying to discover is a trend from one year to the next, um, grouping by year it makes that pattern much easier to see. And the thing I want to point out again here is we can drop down to the example on the bottom right, and we don't necessarily need color to make that assessment. It's the length along a common scale that makes that, uh, that trend difference between the two years easy to see. And then we can start to add in things that allow us to um, uh, even make that more obvious to people, like putting in a reference line uh, across the two graphs um, that shows uh, the the uh, uh, the month that had the largest number of sales for 2015, and then and then carry that number over to 2016. So not only we are confirmed, but on a common scale, we've got higher number of sales in 2016 than we did in 2015. And we can also see the trend really easily. Okay, so the next one we wanna talk about, single representation of the data um, may not be enough to recognize a pattern. Um, and this, there's, there's kind of a three, uh, there's lots of different topics in this realm that I want to talk about, and this this comes in really, um, I think, important in the in the world of Tableau, which you know Tableau has made it so easy to be able to create dashboards where we're we're building graphs and then we're bringing the graphs together in a common presentation. And there's huge advantages, just like in the discussion we had earlier about driving a car. The dashboard's got all kinds of things on it. Um, and that information comes from different um, different sources, different sensors. Um, and so using that dashboard to tell um, as much information as we can has real benefit. And this is a an example of that. On the left, we've got a graph, a scatter plot, some x value against some y value, and we've plotted linear fit. And um, so what we're describing here is we can show all the points of data. We can show a statistical analysis, which is linear fit, um, depending on the, how many observations we've got. Uh, the number of observations can really start to bias that linear fit, because if you've got enough data, you'll always have a linear fit eventually. Um, and so the question becomes, well, how good is this fit? And what else can we tell the user? Well, a residuals plot basically shows for each point how far that point is off the fitted line. This gets us into a, immediately into an area of um, thinking about the notion of intuition. When we're communicating with any user, any uh, viewer, there's a certain set of things that they do and don't know. We always want something to seem intuitive. And intuitive essentially means I already know all this stuff. I hadn't thought about it lately, but I know it. And then when I see it, I go, oh, yeah, I know what that means. Sometimes, given the context and the background of the people viewing our data, we have to provide them visual clues 
about um, how to interpret the information. So sometimes we add things like these lines to try and communicate to people. Okay, this is what we're talking about. We've got a graph of linear fit and we've got a graph of the residuals. In this example, um, it's a good linear fit. And what we can see is the variability around um, the residuals line, the zero line is pretty smooth. This can be really helpful though in some cases if we take an extreme example here where we don't have a linear fit, we've got a curve linear fit. This is a logistic um, data set. And the residuals graph shows quite clearly this S pattern, which tells us that um, it would be a mistake to assume that that data is linear. There's something else going on there. Um, and not only for us as people trying to figure out what's in the data set, but also to communicate that to other people. It's very, <clears throat> excuse me, very important to be able to provide that information, to provide um, a uh, graph that not only shows the data, but another graph that shows whether the interpretation uh, is valid. And third, being able to present some information to help people who are not familiar with this, um, with this confirmatory or converging graph, um, how, to, how to make sense of it. So th those are some critical things that we wanna do in helping people go th get through the data analysis um, the data visualization that we're handing them. So again, the notion here is with linear data, the residuals are equally distributed above and below with logistic data, because it basically is bent at both ends, um, you get this lazy S pattern when it's, when it's laid over on its side. So let's talk about another component here. So, um, one of the advantages of showing uh, data uh, on a map is that you're basically taking something somebody already knows, which is um, a geopolitical uh, representation or geological representation, and you're showing that, and people have some really basic knowledge about this. So they might look down this easily stacked set of states in the middle of the United States here on the left, and then look at um, what has become a very common representation to use the, the hexagons to represent um, geopolitical areas. And they might say, okay, I found North Dakota and Minnesota at the top, so now I ought to be able to look down and see the adjacent states below it. And so um, our objective here is to give people information but minimize their cognitive workload. And I guess the challenge becomes one when you present um, a, a new representation that makes it hard to find things. Um, as I jokingly told um, Shannon and Brianna the other day, uh, I live in Kansas. I can throw a baseball up off my back porch into Missouri and in the representation on the right, I'd be throwing the baseball into Arkansas. Um, so we have to watch out for the extent to which uh, we're trying to communicate and in doing so uh, using a new graphical form, we basically disrupt people's expectations. Okay, um, minimizing cognitive workload. We're trying to not pe make people have to work too hard. So in a graph like this, um, any graph that has a legend you're constantly flipping back and forth between looking at the legend, looking at the graph, looking at the legend, looking at the graph. And in some cases it's relatively simple and it can get uh, complicated to the point where you really can't uh, extract any information very usefully out of a graph. And a, and a very simple alternative to this is to basically stick the legend in the graph. Um, and you can basically take and mark the regions that have a certain value range <laughs> inside the graph and it make it at least somewhat easier to try and find um, um, a definition of the different color differences. And to go uh, to another one here, again, uh, this is the same representation, but the thing I think to talk about here um, is the color. Um, 
uh, color is not a numeric scale. Um, it's difficult at times to interpret uh, even brightness um, or hue differences as being linear or ordinal. Um, and beyond that, you really start to imply certain constraints. So in the example that we've got here, this is a, the color is a representation of percentage. Um, and the issue, I guess, beyond just being able to determine um, where the, the color map, uh, lays on the map, beyond that, then we've got an expectation. If you show me a range of colors from light to dark and you say it's about percentage, do I impose on that that the range is zero to 100%? Do I take the range that they've given me? And as you can see, as I've mapped over here on the right, there's some kind of funny things about the scale here because it basically says that one of these colors represents six, zero to six percent, and then the next two colors represent one percent each, and then the last one represents, you know, 92 percent. Um, that's very difficult for me to start interpreting what's what's trying what we're trying to say about um about um whatever value is being presented here um and it, and it becomes real difficult to judge what i should understand as a result of this other than um and somewhat my suspicion is these 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 uh, percentage bands have been adjusted the bins have been adjusted to try and get differences amongst the the states visualized in the map and i'm not sure that that's necessarily a particularly useful thing to understand i i, I want to understand you know what what's the outcome where are we at in this situation um when we give people interactivity um you know the thing is that these tools that we have available to us now are really good at this and then the question is okay well what do we do with that um First of all, you've got a really, um, it's, it becomes a real challenge at times when the scale of the tools that we've got become too small for, and this is a response problem. Do we have enough room to be able to grab a hold of the various tools effectively and use them? And that's just strictly a response interaction kinds of question. But beyond that, there becomes the question, okay, well, what, what can I learn here? So let's just take an example, and let's say that in time one, I look at this map, and the thing that I might want to think is, can I keep track of this data point over time? And as we start to move through time here, okay, I'm not sure I still know which one it was, and I don't know what the changes are. There's changes in color, and there's changes in size, and it's a real challenge to try and track that information over time. And if the objective is to be able to compare over time, uh, while this may be visually entertaining, I'm not sure that it communicates, <clears throat> excuse me, communicates very effectively. Another thing here, which I'm just gonna touch on real briefly, and that is anytime we stick an alarm in a dashboard, and this is not a particularly effective example necessarily, but I have to tell you, um, when you use alarms in systems, alarms can hit the point where they detract from the user being able to do the job they're, in they're, they're intended uh, to accomplish, um, especially when these flashing or movement is out in the periphery. Um, and one of the things we want to do is we want to let people do their work. Um, there's a long history uh, of uh, operators disabling alarm systems because they're so distracting they can't work on the system and that has lots of very negative consequences so we need to watch out for that um, a very important thing here um, that we want to consider is the extent to which the graphical elements that we can add to a, a to a visual um, uh, representation are they adding or are they just basically distracting? And you can see the same data represented on the right as on the left, and the ability to um, extract what's going on is really nice on the right by literally stripping um, superfluous information away from the graph. 
And we're running kind of short on time here. I'm just going to pop through some things real quickly here. One of the things that we have to consider is the human visual system plays some really serious tricks. Um, and I don't mean tricks in a negative sense. That This is the way the visual system works. The visual system finds, thing, finds those things based on lines and intersections, and it doesn't need color to do that work. We can take advantage of that in our um, data visualizations, as in this example. The minute you put um, a box around something you want somebody to attend to, your eye is immediately drawn to that. And that's an extremely effective tool to get people's uh, attention where, uh, where you want it to be. When you put circles um, in adjacent to each other, uh, the size of the adjacent circles dramatically affects perception of those circle sizes. We see graphs um, like this on a regular basis, and it is really hard to try and determine what the sizes of those circles are, which ones are the same or which ones are different. An alternative that was presented by Cleveland years ago was basically to say, well, instead of using color fills or circles, uh, if you use um, a graphic element that basically presents um, a length on a common scale, you basically solve the problem for people being able to determine what you mean about each state without having to try and extract information from a legend. Um, color surrounds can create real problems and it doesn't necessarily just have to be color. It can be uh, grayscale. They seriously affect the perception of um, um, the color that they're adjacent to. And we, we see this when we get into um, uh, large numbers of uh, regions or categories being represented um, um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a map like this. Here's some very good resources for help with color selection. Uh, I mean, to me, as a perfect example, the graph on the bottom, they did a really nice job of color selection in this because you can basically strip it from its original version down to a, uh, 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 down to limiting uh, color vision in, in the red spectrum, down to stripping color away completely. And you can still see the differences that are intended there. Very quick comment about um, the notion of redundant coding. Um, we use uh, octagons that are red and uh, triangles that are yellow to indicate um, hazard or, or warning states in systems because those things push a perceived difference um, that people can readily see. Color changes, brightness, and saturation variations, um, almost impossible for people to see. So settling on those redundant shape and color codes improves recognition. Um, and if you start messing with all kinds of variations on a code that you really want to matter to people, the end result will be you, you will disrupt that to the point where people are going to have a hard time seeing it. Uh, you know, we got a lot of things in here that are just real common things that we see all the time. These things are fundamental to the way the visual system operates. And if you can take advantage of those or avoid problems with those, you can incorporate these things in into uh, data visualization to good advantage. So I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon to kind of wrap up here. Sure. So we know we went through some of that fast and um, we will leave time for questions here at the end. But one last point we need to make because we could not hold our heads high as UX and human factors psychologists if we did not talk a little bit more about designing for your user. It's sort of the number one rule uh, that, that guides what we do. So again, as it, going back to the beginning where you're thinking about the goals of your data visualization, we also at that time, at that beginning, also think about who your users are and in what context they're going to be using your visualizations. You know, thinking through what do they need to understand from your visualization um, and how much will, of that will they know? Do, do you need to help by teaching them a little bit? Uh, you know, do they know about your domain or does your graph need to have a textual supplement or again, just using some of the techniques we 
pointed out today to bubble up conclusions for the users. Um, you need to consider that. You also need to consider where are the users, not only in the flow of their job, but physically as they use your your uh, your visualization. Um, you know, what are their goals? Do they need the information fast? So do you need to you know, uh, make it easy for them to at a glance, get the conclusion they need? Are they under stress, which also will need means you need to make it super easy for them to uh, accurately understand your graph. Are they in, in noisy conditions? Are they in conditions of poor or glaring lighting? These might affect your choices of using color versus not, of using sound versus not. And of course, last but not least, you know, are there accessibility needs? Going back to those redundant systems Kevin was just talking about, if you, you know, the, the general population out there does have colorblind individuals, if you are relying solely on color to communicate differences in da data, that's going to leave out part of your audience. Same for hearing, and there's a number of other considerations. We could talk for a couple hours on this topic because it's so important, but again, we just at least wanted to bubble it up as something to consider that you need to consider your user first, last, and in between all the time. So in conclusion, next slide. We just uh, want you to take away a few, a few Key areas. First of all, um, of course, you need to begin by understanding the data behind your visualizations, because obviously different data types demand different types of visualizations to tell the accurate story what's going on. And hopefully today at least has given you a little bit of a taste of um, understanding how humans perceive information. Remember just that simple model of TCA and then build on those two fundamental learnings to create visualizations that take full advantage of these areas versus fall prey to some of the, those concepts that we introduced you to today. So that is what we've got and um, excellent. We've just met our goal to leave a few minutes at the end to um, take questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Shannon. So it does look like we were able to tackle all of the questions in the Q&A, but I just wanted to be the first person to say that that was amazing. Uh, you know, I have a background in psychology, so I love this stuff. Uh, and, you know, these types of design principles honestly transcend Tableau. They're good practices for even if you're designing PowerPoints or, you know, if you're trying to pack a car for a car trip and you need to have your snacks near the people who are going to eat snacks. So these are all principles that once you start to learn them, you can't stop seeing them in your everyday life. So uh, thank you both. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Shannon, for joining us today. Um, and if there are any questions from anyone out there, you can reach Kevin, Shannon at these uh, uh, contact channels, I suppose, or you can reach out to us at the Tableau team directly and we can route whatever you might need. Thank you guys again. And also uh, this, uh, this meeting was recorded and it's going to be published on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So if you missed anything, want to rewind, want to watch it again, uh, it can be viewed there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.